Module 6, Ethics Part 1, Lecture 6b, Ethical Subjectivism, Cultural Relativism. Normative Ethics. We will be studying normative ethics, which looks at different systems to make ethical decisions. This is different from meta-ethics, which looks at the status of ethical statements. It is also different from applied ethics, which looks at particular questions such as medical ethics or animal rights. Normative ethics can be divided into two broad areas, relative ethics and universal ethics. In this module, we will be studying relative ethics, ethics which vary from person to person or community to community. This includes ethical subjectivism, cultural relativism, and divine command theory. In the next module, we will be studying universal ethics, ethics that apply to every human being. These include virtue theory, natural law theory, ethical egoism, utilitarianism, deontology, and feminine care ethics. Relative ethics. Relative ethics teaches there's no single ethical standard that applies to all human beings. Ethics varies from person to person, community to community, or religion to religion. This is based on the ancient sophist idea that man is the measure of all things. Relative ethics can be cognitive, have a truth value, at least for a particular community or for a particular person, or it can be non-cognitive, have no truth value. Ethics is simply personal feelings. Ethical subjectivism. The word subject is an individual person and what they feel. Ethics comes from feelings. Ernest Hemingway said, about morals, I know only what is moral is what you feel good after, and what is immoral is what you feel bad after. David Hume said that you cannot learn ethics from science. You cannot learn an ought from an is. The source of ethics is mere sentiments. To decide what is ethical, one needs only to look at what feels right. If it feels good, do it. And one person's feelings may differ from another's. Just as we cannot <clears throat> argue about taste, I like vanilla and you like chocolate, so we cannot argue about ethics. I feel abortion is right, you feel abortion is wrong. There is no way to decide such a question. It's all feelings. The logical positivists taught that the only statements we can make are logical statements and empirical statements, which can be verified. Murder is wrong is neither a logical statement nor an empirical statement. A.J. Ayer, 1910-1989, on the right, a British philosopher of the logical positive school, compared saying, murder is wrong, to saying simply, I don't like murder. Such an approach to ethics is often called emotivism. Ethics is pure emotions, whatever we feel, as if to say, boo, murder. Sometimes this is called the hooray, boo, theory of ethics. Feelings versus reason. A central tenet of the Enlightenment was the centrality of reason to interpret human affairs. Immanuel Kant famously wrote in his 1784 essay, What is Enlightenment? The phrase, Saper Aude, dare to know. It can be translated, dare to reason. Kant would develop his ethical theory into deontology based entirely on human reason. We will study that. One would think that the Enlightenment approach to ethics would be entirely based on reason. Nonetheless, not everybody agreed with the centrality of human reason. Already, the Christian philosopher Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662, we studied him when we talked about Pascal's wager, taught, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. But the true beginning of a philosophy built on feelings rather than reason was the Romantic philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778. As mentioned above, Rousseau believed that humans are naturally good. It is civilization, including civilization's emphasis on human rationality that corrupts people. Rousseau taught that if human beings could be raised in nature, they would naturally do the right thing. They would follow their feelings. 
This argument between reason and feelings continues to our day. Cultural relativism. Ethics comes from culture. The fundamental claim of cultural relativism is that ethics are culturally bound and right or wrong grows out of a particular culture. There are no universal ethics by which we can judge a culture. Ethics are entirely a construct of one's culture. If a culture justifies sati, which we talked about already, or female genital mutilation or cannibalism or even slavery, no other culture can claim that these practices are wrong. Famed anthropologist Ruth Benedict, 1887 to 1948, on right, taught that the appropriate term to use in anthropological studies is not ethics, but habits. She writes, we do not any longer make the mistake of deriving the morality of our locality and decade directly from the inevitable constitution of human nature. We do not elevate it to the dignity of a first principle. We recognize that morality differs in every society and is a convenient term for socially approved habits. Mankind has always preferred to say it is morally good rather than it is habitual, but historically these two phrases are synonymous. The concept of the normal is properly a variant of the concept of the good. It is that which society has approved. Calling behaviors such as cannibalism or headhunting habits rather than ethics removes any ethical judgment from such behavior. It is wrong for our culture, but right for another culture, and no culture can judge another culture, according to this idea. Do ethics evolve? Hegel. Hegel's dialectic provides an important criticism to cultural relativism. As we've already learned, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770 to 1831 and right, is considered the most influential European philosopher of the 19th century. He was an idealist, seen mind or spirit, to use Hegel's term Geist, as the ultimate reality. He was a strong believer that Geist or spirit is dynamic, evolving and changing. Hegel spoke about a three-part dynamic as ideas evolved. First, there is thesis, the current reality of an idea. Then there is antithesis, ideas that challenge that reality, causing disorientation. And finally, this is resolved by synthesis, a new reality. However, the synthesis becomes the new thesis and the process starts over. As mentioned earlier, Hegel called this the dialectic. Let us apply Hegel's ideas to the evolution of ethics. Thesis. Slavery is a fundamental part of the economic system in the southern states. It's just simply what is. Antithesis. A growing movement against slavery led by abolitionists, plus novels such as Uncle Tom's Cabin. Synthesis. Slavery is finally overthrown after a bloody civil war. Ideas have evolved and changed. Slavery is overthrown, but it will take a century for the civil rights movement to change the status of blacks. Of course, if ethics evolves according to Hegel's dialectic, what is the end point? Where is it going? Is there an ethical ideal at the end of the process? Hegel thought the ideal was 19th century Prussia. Today we realize that ethical ideas have come a long way since then, and they are constantly evolving.